Summer University here, we have minimum one session that is dedicated to Southeast Europe or, 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 the, or the Balkans. And uh, a lot of the work, especially of the Polanyi Center, is dedicated to, to the politics uh, in the Balkans, what uh, me and Igor are mostly, uh, mostly doing. And some of these issues that we will be covering today were already mentioned during the discussions of the, of the previous week. So I wouldn't say it's still shameless self-promotion, but just an announcement that uh, we are uh, in the process of, our, of a book project uh, at the moment uh, here at the Polanyi Center. A month ago, or a month and a half ago, we had a, we had a, a workshop uh, here in Husek where we invited uh, some I don't know, 15 scholars from working on uh, various topics uh, from, the, from the Balkans. But we decided to dedicate that project and that book uh, on two very burning topics and very hot topics in social sciences today. And those are memory politics and, uh, and populism. So the idea behind our volume is to explore how political organizations in contemporary southeastern European societies, marked by the rise of illiberalism and populism, utilize memory in order to maintain hegemony over the political landscape. So when we speak about uh, populism, it's very often that we just equate it with illiberalism. I think that with Igor and I, uh, uh, we, in our work, we, we take a little bit of a different uh, approach, more discursive approach. We're more interested about uh, popu seeing populism as uh, building communities or or about constructing and reconstructing the people who are the pure uh, uncorrupted people against some kind of corrupted elite so it's always about us us uh, the good people versus the versus the bad elites and quite often or almost every time when you speak about the Balkans this coincides with the nation and nationalism but it does not have to be in the way that, I, that, uh, that we see it. So to give a little bit of an introduction before I leave the floor to, to the panelists, um, memory politics we see it every day and at every level. Uh, we had a session uh, last week about uh, remembering and forgetting uh, communism, for example, in Central Europe. So we see, for example, in the macro level, at, uh, at the highest state politics level. Uh, two very recent examples are from Macedonia, and we have we have a uh, we have a dominance, I would say, of Macedonians <laughs> and from the participants in the summer university. So we had an interstate agreement first between Macedonia and Bulgaria that had very serious repercussions on exactly the memory politics and how the people of these two countries are going to be dealing uh, with uh, conflicting national myths to establish common, uh, for example, to establish common commissions who are going to be opening, looking at the history textbooks, what kind of prejudices are uh, included in, on, on both sides, or to observe and commemorate something that this, at least these two governments are seeing as common, common history or common heroes, but who are facing a serious uh, resistance uh, uh, at home, especially in, in Macedonia. On the other hand, a much more mediatized and famous example is the agreement, the recent agreement between Macedonia and Greece on the name issue, which again touches very much on memory politics and how especially how, how Macedonians are remembering uh, certain, certain events. And one of the critics of this agreement, because of the uh, uh, interventions in memory politics, one of these critics has even called uh, this, the, the, this agreement is going to create uh, out of Macedonia the first politically correct police state. Uh, on the other hand, uh, at, at lower levels uh, on, on state, uh, on, on, uh, with, within the state, we have examples of state officials who are rehabilitating and paying respect in front of uh, monuments of uh, Nazi collaborationists and war criminals from the wars from the 90s. Such examples we can see in Croatia, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we can see it in Macedonia, we can see it in Serbia. When we even go lower at the local level, on communities and various sites of memory, one of these examples will be covered by Igor, for example, uh, such, such as cemeteries. And he will, he will show the example of the Partisan Cemetery 
uh, in, in Mostar and how it affects everyday life and politics uh, in, in this city or in the whole uh, country of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Furthermore, it penetrates even the tiniest level of everyday life. One extremely interesting, even funny example is when uh, Croatian president Kolinda Grava Kitanovic uh, in 2016 uh, visited kindergarteners on uh, the day that is called Defenders of Dubrovnik Day. So it commemorates uh, 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 veterans uh, from the homeland war uh, from the 90s. And in a care package for the children, pre the president included a picture of herself and some chocolate. Big scandal broke out when actually this chocolate was Serbian made. <laughs> so it was from this, the, the enemies from the homeland, homeland war. She had to apologize. <laughs> and everything she, they, they returned, so she found good Croatian chocolates to give to the Croatian children. So, memory politics are also how we choose to forget and to, and, uh, and to remember. Uh, and uh, also they colorate with so many of the contemporary issues that we already covered last week. For example, uh, Macedonians remember the suffering of the uh, uh, Macedonian uh, people uh, who were uh, exiled uh, from uh, the civil war in Greece in 1948. However, conveniently, Macedonians also forget when they need to correlate this uh, and, uh, and ignore the similarities when we have refu contemporary refugees at our borders or when we need to open uh, the doors from, from, for them. So we conveniently forget some of these, uh, some of these things. Finally, it transcends the borders of the Balkans. Think of uh, Bleiburg in Austria, which was very recently commemorated uh, by far-right uh, uh, Croatian people commemorating uh, uh, the, the massacre of, uh, of Nazi collaborationists. Uh, but this is, again, in Austria. Or finally, my final example would be, again, uh, going beyond Europe and the fights that are happening in Australia between Macedonian and Greek diaspora on a daily level. So without further ado, we have three uh, panelists uh, here today. Uh, first, I would uh, present Astrea Pejovic, who is uh, uh, a doctoral candidate at the Central European Studies, uh, sorry, Central European University and uh, uh, in anthropology. And she's, she's, she's working on these issues. Then we have IASC's very own uh, Igor Stipic from Bosnia and Herzegovina. And finally, I'm very happy uh, to have here a dear friend of the Institute, Professor Rubin Zeman, who, uh, who is a uh, professor in anthropology, and recently he assumed political position as uh, special advisor to the prime minister on issues of multiculturalism. And interculturalism. And interculturalism, sorry. Yes. Uh, so first, uh, I will give the floor uh, to our guest. Uh, Rubin, please take about 20 minutes to tell us. OK. <laughs> sure, yeah. Thank you, Dimitar. First of all, it's really my Big pleasure to be for the second time here. Thank you for your invitation, uh, Ferenc and uh, Aniko, and all our friends uh, from the East and West Studies course. Actually, uh, I'm anthropologist, and uh, my approach on this uh, topic will be anthropological, much more political anthropological. Very recently, probably those who are following now the, the football World Cup in Russia, I think it was uh, one week ago, it was uh, also a big or huge uh, issue when the two Switzerland players uh, with uh, Kosovo Albanian origin, Jaka and Shachiri, they, uh, they gave a goal and actually they eliminated Serbia from the, from the football cup. Uh, but after they are giving the goal, they show it this. Uh, Sign. It's actually the sign of a um, of, uh, double-head eagle of the Albanian flag, which uh, actually showed that flag, uh, the, the eagle is flying. <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually, it was in, among, especially among the Kosovo Albanians, it was a sign of, uh, of liberation from the Serbian, uh, they say, occupation. You wanted the Serbians. That's another uh, uh, explanations uh, and wording for all the issues that happened in Kosovo. But what is, uh, what is very important for us that uh, how the, the people understand that all the sign, especially how uh, it, it, that there was in Albania, in, uh, in, uh, 
in Dulce, uh, it's Duracchio, actually, ancient city, on a, on a sea coast, and we watched the football there, and actually all the Albanian citizens of the nation were very happy. And even the president of Albania, uh, Ilir Meta, he organized a special party for that in his residency, uh, even that the Switzerland was playing football at Albania. <laughs> but, <laughs> but however, it was uh, very interesting what has happened there, especially what has happened in Kosovo also, because these two players were from Kosovo. Uh, of course, the Serbians and other uh, Orthodox nations around they accepted it as a big provocation or some or even as a as a hate speech signal of hate speech. Uh, what, what they say, oh, and uh, they they make a complaint to the to the FIFA, and I think that those two or three players also yeah, are sanctioned with a few thousand of. Uh, of Euros, I don't know uh, what to say, but we'll see what will be in the future for that. Uh, and uh, of course, one friend of us, uh, Florian Weibers, uh, from, uh, from uh, Graz, a uh, famous scholar actually, from Southeast European Studies, uh, he, he made one very interesting uh, uh, tweet or post in uh, Facebook. He said, Actually, that uh, Jaka and, um, and Shachiri, they they made one sign of a final unification of the, of the Balkans because the same sign, eagle, is in a flag of Serbia, and flag of Montenegro, and so on. But not so much people are aware about that. That uh, the same symbol, eagle, is a is a symbol in all these flags. So you see that how uh, the Balkans generally it's. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's living in a, in a world of, of mythology, especially when we are talking about semiology and science and national building symbols and, and, and memories, of course, and, and populism. Actually, all this, what has happened one week ago, it's a populism also, because uh, generally in Albania and Kosovo it was a national celebration, even in Switzerland, won the, the match, not Albania or Kosovo. So it was one kind of uh, populism made. Uh, to understand actually the Southeast uh, Europe or Balkans or the Western Balkans, what is going on with all these uh, issues regarding the, uh, the, the populism and the memory, I agree with Dimitar that populism actually in the Balkans is generally related with the national building process and is related with, uh, with the myth of the national building, of the national creation and, and so on. So uh, for that reason, we must, uh, we as anthropologists must go back uh, to, the, to the process of a nation building. Uh, you have to also be aware that in the Balkans, understanding of the nation is according to the, to the primordialistic uh, uh, understanding. It's not on a constructive way, it's one of what that is uh, Western European or, or in America or Canada. So the Balkans generally, the biggest ethnic group because of the historical context after the Berlin Congress and after the Balkan War, they get the right to, to make the state. And for that reason, they grow in from the ethnic community, they grow into the nation immediately. But uh, those nations, uh, yeah, unfortunately, because of the tragic history that we have in the Balkans, they wanted to make uh, ethnically clean, ethnically homogeneous nations. Uh, generally, maybe, OK, we can speak about Slovenia. Uh, even 90 percent are maybe ethnic, even in very discussion. Well, but generally, the Balkans is no chance to make to, to, to construct ethnic clean uh, nations. And for that reason, we have in the Balkans the, the, the myth also about the homogeneity of the other nation. And unfortunately, this myth of the homogeneity and ethnic clean we still may see now in this latest. Uh, Protest what has happened in Greece, especially as Dimitar mentioned in after this agreement between the, uh, the, the Greece and Macedonia. And we can see also that a lot of uh, price from the Greek Orthodox Church are protesting. So, <laughs> generally, it's very, for example, for the uh, all other states in the Union world, it's not understandable how it's possible the priests to go to, to protest and to, <laughs> to, to protect an uh, uh, issue related with the uh, with, uh, ethnic identity and with uh, the nation construction, but this is happening in the Balkans. Even we had also reaction in Macedonia, so also some uh, metropolis, uh, 
metropolis. May, may made some also statesmen just to make a, <laughs> a revenge to the, to the Greek uh, priest and so on. So uh, if you are going to the theoretical level, and especially on, on the, for me one of the, of the best uh, scholars regarding to the national building and the national construction, it's Benedict Anderson, of course, the, those who read the book about the major communities, nation major communities, who is saying that uh, each nation is actually construction. We don't have nothing objectively in a, in a, in a, in a nation building, we, it's just construction. And what kind of elements we will use in a building of the uh, house of the nation is depend of the, of course, of the political and intellectual leader, how we are constructed. Uh, and uh, all the nations are different, so they are variables uh, on, the, on the way how they are built. And uh, for that reason, uh, uh, for us anthropologists and probably even political science uh, scholars, uh, actually, because when they are making the constructions, they are taking any historical context from the past and uh, to, to make the pillars of, of the house called nation. And for that reason, for us, it's not important what has really happened historically in any date or in any case, but it's very important how that historical context is used on a national building myth. For example, if we, if we say what really happened with the first Serbian uprising with Kara George Petrovic and so on, we will see it's, there were so many ridiculous issues, also with the Indian uprising, what has happened in Macedonia, or I don't know, with the, what has happened with the Greek uprising in 1820. You will see that historically there are so many ridiculous issues there, but of course the intellectuals are making a myth of that, and now they are making contraction. We may discuss if you want that later about that, uh, that issue. So, uh, Especially when now we're deconstructing, because anthropologists are deconstructing the, the myth of the, of the nation building. When we are deconstructing now, the main pillars actually for, for all these uh, issues, uh, especially in the Balkans, is that we have to deconstruct the myth of homogeneity and the myth of the constitution of the ethno-constitutional myth, actually. Like, for example, the Jews, they have the myth of the exodus, and that's a very important myth in their construction. So while they are making construction, each group, each nation must, in a history explanation, they must go through the victimization. That uh, if you're asking each uh, nation, each people in the Balkan, they said, oh, we have very uh, hard history, very tough history. Our descendants, grand grandfather, they went through the big process of victimization, and so on. So everybody in the, in the Balkan, probably in the Europe, not the Balkan, they went to that process of victimization. And after the victimization, it's a period of the leader who, who, who safe is a survey for the, the, the nation. For that reason, he is one kind of, um, how to say, the, the father, like Ataturk, actually, in Turkey. Ataturk is mean father of the Turks nation. He's, actually, his name is uh, Kemal, Kemal Mustafa Kemal Pash. Uh, uh, and now, I, I want to return, but, uh, because we don't have so much time. Uh, what has actually happened between the, the national duty process in Greece, in Bulgaria, Macedonia, and Serbia? Because uh, for, for that issue we will discuss here. So, uh, in the beginning of the, of the 19th century, when the Greek state was created in 1820, actually it was uh, made on a pillar of the Orthodox Christianity. Because it was the Ottoman Empire and the Greek state uh, has to be one of the uh, antipod of the Ottoman Empire, which is a Muslim state. And uh, the Greek state now, actually also the, the Western powers, they wanted to make one kind of, uh, of the Christian um, center in the Balkans that we also, did after that, will make politics in the Balkans. So actually it was built on an on a Orthodox Christianity. And for that reason, we have a lot of uh, non-ethnic Greek in a, in a Greek uprising in 1920. We have a lot of Vlachs, for example. Actually, the leader of the, of the Greek uh, uprising, in, uh, in the, the, the most of them were from the Vlach community. <laughs> we, we know very well anthropologists. Also, we have a lot of Bulgarians, we have Macedonians, Albanians we have also in the dead so-called Greek uprising. But uh, 
uh, in that time, uh, understanding of the legal identity it was equalized with the uh, orthodoxy. <laughs> so, uh, and even it was a big, big issue because the, the center of the uh, orthodox Christian orthodoxy at that time was in uh, Istanbul, and uh, the, the uh, church leader in Istanbul, which of course they are with a Greek uh, nationality, most of them with the Vlach, but they supported the Ottoman Empire all the time. They are so-called Fanarios because the Fanari is the, the place where is the city in Istanbul. Fanarios, they protect the, the Sultan and the, and the Ottoman Empire. But uh, for, for that reason, uh, Greek intellectuals decided that they must make autonomous Greek church in Athens. And as a consequence, today in Christianity and Balkans, we have national or ethnic churches. We have Greek Orthodox Church. After that, Bulgarians make it <coughs> one antipod. They make Bulgarian Orthodox Church, Serbian Orthodox Church, and, and so on. We don't have now uh, yet, but it's a big uh, issue in Montenegro, I think. It should be Montenegrian uh, Orthodox Church. And of course, the biggest issue is now between Macedonian and Serbian Orthodox Church, because the Macedonian Orthodox Church now is uh, uh, asking, not now, it's sort of the issue of the Macedonian Church is from uh, from the middle of the 20th century, during the socialist time, and, uh, and Macedonian Orthodox Church is asking the, uh, the roots in a famous Ohit archbishop that was uh, in the 9th and 10th century, very powerful church. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, because now we have so-called ethnic or national churches, it's a, it's a big problem also about the recognition because Macedonia has a problem with the church with Serbia. We have a problem with the name with the, <laughs> with the Greek about the antiquity, the history, remembering. And we have also the similar problem with the Bulgarians with the issue of the language and, uh, as they said, the common history, Bulgarians, even if they say that Macedonia is one of the most romantic parts of the Bulgarian history, they are saying, but of course, it's, again, it's an issue how they are constructing their identity. And, and now when we're coming to the especially it's very interesting when we discuss about myths uh, in, a, in a middle age for example there was that time was not uh, ethnic identity especially right after the the Balkans was fought on, on Ottoman rule and one of that uh, example good example is the myth of the King Marco Kali Marco actually so all Macedonians, Serbians, uh, Bulgarians, uh, even in Vlachs and so they have still they have the the myth of so-called Kali Marko, uh, and even they say that he he, is, he was their own king, even that he was an Ottoman vassal. What is really was happening in the history? He was the Ottoman vassal. He was served to the Ottoman uh, army, but uh, in a memory, in the memory of the people, he is a hero who is protecting the the Orthodox people from the. Islamization or, 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 or other issue. And even if you have that, the one um, in the Serbia is a very famous proverb saying, Kastas to Jemarko in a Kosovo Poly, saying that two later life Marko in a Kosovo field where was this famous uh, battle in 1389 among the Ottomans and the, and the Serbs. Okay, what is uh, the, now the, the, the the main of what is happening in Macedonia, and um, Aniko was surprised in Skopje when she came, <laughs> when she saw so big, and also very so big monuments of Alexander the Great and Philip the Second. I call it monumentalism. Monumentalism. <laughs> most, <laughs> outmost yeah. monumentalism in Macedonia, yeah. unprecedented. Yeah. So yeah. wonderful. So, also, you are welcome, uh, everybody of you, to, to come in Skopje to see that famous monument of Alexander the Great. <laughs> uh, but uh, what is really uh, the, the, the problem there? The problem is that uh, uh, after the Berlin Congress in 1878, uh, all these states uh, around uh, Macedonia, actually it was decided that uh, Greece will be independent, will get independence in Montenegro, Serbia, Romania, and Bulgaria. And the Ottoman uh, Empire uh, took uh, Macedonia, uh, Kosovo, and Albania, actually, they still keep it. And, uh, of course, uh, all these uh, Orthodox uh, uh, people around uh, the, the Ottomans uh, or the nations in uh, 1912, they make a so-called uh, Balkanic alliance or Orthodox alliance against the Ottoman Empire. 
And in 1912, uh, uh, it was a uh, so-called Balkan Wars, the first Balkan War, where the Ottoman Empire was uh, retreat back in uh, two days borders, where is Turkey. But uh, uh, immediately after that one year, 1913, was the second Balkan War, uh, where it was uh, a war be between the, the, the alliances now, how to divide the Macedonia or other, in other places. And in the same time, in 1912, uh, 10 and 1912, it was so called Albanian uh, rebellion, and when the Albanian state was created in 1912. So, it's also interesting we don't have time what has happened with the Turkish minority in Albania and so on, but maybe next time we'll discuss about that. Uh, or in the discussion. In a discussion. <coughs> and um, after this Balkan War, actually, the Greece uh, state, which until that, uh, generally, the remembrance of the people. It's not was present that they are the descendants of the ancient Macedonia, but they were the, the descendants of the of the famous uh, soldier Pericle and Themistocle and Diltiat and so on. But after the Balkan Wars, they make a new narrative, actually, and they uh, concur, uh, or actually Thessaloniki was given as a gift uh, uh, to the Greeks because no any pallet was uh, shot during the, <laughs> the siege of the, of the Thessaloniki. Uh, even that uh, one or two years ago, the Ottoman army was so powerful, for example, in Gallipoli, the British army and other alliances, they, they, they lose from that uh, Ottoman <coughs> army there. So it was not probably the issue of uh, how strong was the army, but probably it was the issue of any political negotiations, because Thessaloniki was just gift as a gift to the Greeks. And for that time, the, the, the Greek took this Macedonia. I, Actually, also in Macedonia, it's one wrong narrative that we are saying that before Balkan War, it was the state of Macedonia. It was not true, it was Ottoman Empire, and the Macedonia actually is a, one kind of, a, of region which is very heterogeneous. Uh, and of this region, actually, uh, the majority, of course, are, are Macedonians are in, in that place of Kavala and Bulgarians. We have a lot of Vlachs there. We have a lot of, uh, it was at that time a big uh, also Turkish Muslim community, which after 1928 they were, it was a contract between Greece and Turkey for exchange of population. So around one and a half million Muslims were evicted to, to Turkey and half a million Orthodox Greeks, they, they came to Macedonia, this ethnic, Egea uh, Macedonia. So now we have that totally exchange of the democratic structure. Uh, okay, what, whatever, uh, today Greece has 51% of so-called uh, Macedonia region. Mas today Macedonia, or from September probably the North Macedonia, 38%, 11% are in, uh, in Bulgaria, 1% is in, in Albania and so on. But, uh, uh, and this uh, part which is today uh, Macedonia, uh, actually, during the Yugoslavia time, get uh, the right to, to create the state. One of the federal units of Yugoslavia was uh, uh, the, the Macedonia. For that reason, a lot of Bulgarians say that Macedonia is creation of Tito or Cominterna and so on. Very ridiculous for me uh, narrative. But uh, after now the solution of Yugoslavia, uh, it's a period uh, the issue of, um, of the state actually the, the people with referendum in 1991, they wanted to make a separate state with name Macedonia, and actually uh, we, we, we still don't have uh, archives what has really happened. According to some scholars, what has happened that uh, uh, Milosevic and Mitsotakis, not this Mitsotakis, but the father of Mitsotakis, who is now an actual politician, uh, they make one kind of agreement. They said uh, Milosevic is from Mitsotakis, that until the Serbia is fighting there with Bosnia and <laughs> Croatia, uh, Mitsotakis could blockade the integration of Macedonia and United States. And after that, when Mitsotakis resolved the issue with, uh, in, a, in the West, then he would take again Macedonia and so on. Uh, we don't have uh, so much uh, information around it, that, but uh, it's uh, one kind of, uh, of narrative, oral history among the politicians. I spoke to one day with Stranando. He was one of the uh, he was the first president of the parliament, actually, of Macedonia. We just discussed about this issue. Well, this is really happened. So actually, Greece entered in this uh, uh, issue without, uh, how to say, um, deep strategy, <laughs> what we really go. Because what they, uh, 
late they escaped from Macedonia to change the name and so on, and to change the identity. So today it is from, uh, uh, not in what is not, but in negotiations. Uh, actually, on the opposition of Greece is asking that we no right to people to declare there is Macedonia, which is ridiculous in 21st century, somebody to, to, to stop to declare <laughs> however he or she is uh, feeling herself. Uh, and but okay, Scots, Scotsias, and, uh, and Cyprus now we're fighting very well. So actually, in the Greece, we have a very, how to say, uh, non-liberal society about this issue. Because if you now you don't know, the Greece still didn't uh, sign the Framework Convention on Potential National Minorities, and it's not ratified in the Parliament. And the Greek is not recognizing any other identity except the, the, the Greek identity. Even the Turks, they are not Turks, they are the Muslim community. Uh, Vlachs, especially, is a also big community there and uh, all other communities, but they are not recognized, they are, don't have any rights. Opposite to that, for example, in ex Yugoslavia, from where Macedonia is coming, with Yugoslav heritage, it was one kind of atmosphere of uh, respecting diversity, each diversity has a right to, to our freedom of identity, and for that reason we have also that conflict there among two concepts of liberal democracy understanding and primordialistic, homogeneous understanding of the, of the, of the nation. And, um, okay, now we have a contract with Greeks. In September we have to organize a referendum. The name will be changed in Northern Macedonia, which actually is uh, mathematically, as uh, the Macedonian opposition leader said, it's mathematically precise that we are not in Macedonia. <laughs> uh, but however, it's, uh, now we have a huge, uh, how to say, Protests in the both sides. It's for me very interesting because this ultra right swings in Macedonia and in, in Greece for me is dealing in one coordination because they have they use the same narrative again the quarters. <laughs> As everywhere. Yeah, they use the same narrative for that and now it's uh, this liberal democratic and uh, left wing parties and all forces that are trying to convince the people that the contract is okay. So. From other side, uh, okay, five minutes we will finish. <laughs> what is very important uh, now, uh, we with Bulgaria. With Bulgaria, actually, it's a problem about the history. Yes, because uh, when was this uh, uh, uprising? And before the uprising, or the uprising, actually, uh, it was not clear the identity building of the people, of the future people. So it's true that some of the revolutionaries of Macedonian movement, committee movement, we say, communist division at that time, were declared as a, as a Bulgarian. For example, Bocedor, <coughs> he said, yes, I'm Bulgarian. Uh, or Yane Sandalski, even Yane Sandalski is from the Vah community, he is a Romanian, but he declared himself as Bulgarian. <laughs> then we have uh, another, uh, never mind, uh, and actually, uh, when the elite uprising was, uh, uh, was was made in 1903, which is the uprising is one of the constitutional myths of the Macedonian nation-building process. Uh, even now, one of the proposals with the Greek uh, uh, dispute before the contract <coughs> one of the proposals of the Prime Minister Zayev was, okay, let's make the name to be Elite Macedonia, <laughs> which is for me also a very funny uh, proposal. Uh, but, uh, okay, probably it was a um, test in Belgium, I said, <laughs> that in Macedonia, for other purposes. Uh, but, uh, and the Bulgarians are saying that this uprising is a uh, It's uh, one also Christian uh, holiday in Bulgaria, because the Bulgarians are according to the new style of the calendar, and dealing that is from the old style of calendar, what the Macedonians are using in the Orthodox calendar. For the reason, for the same day, they are using two different <laughs> names. Uh, they, they are saying that it's one of the prizes that the Bulgarian nations and so on uh, organized. It's not only that issue, it's also the issue of the language, because uh, Bulgarian and Macedonian are very similar. Even there are a lot of differences, especially the linguistics. And we at the Bosnian we know where all the differences between the Bulgarian and the, and the Macedonian language. But of course today, unfortunately, we still, he still have in Bulgaria primordialism and identity. Uh, 
And uh, of course, the language is not anymore the, the, the main pillar of the identity. We have now the problem with the, uh, Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, and Bosnia. So it's one language. During the Yugoslavia, we say there are different dialects, Ekavski, Kajkavski, and so on. But today, we have four different languages. Croatia, Bosnia, Montenegro, and Serbian language. So uh, I think the difference between the Macedonian and Bulgarian language is much more than, uh, for example, from Croatia to Serbian language. <laughs> but, uh, however, uh, Bulgaria is, uh, is, uh, is making a case of it. Uh, of course, Macedonia has to integrate it in NATO in, uh, in uh, European Union. For that reason, we, uh, we make these two contracts because of the uh, to enter the European Union in NATO. Of course, we don't need to have any more uh, disputes. And of course, we must negotiate, we must take, have a dialogue, negotiation. Unfortunately, this also uh, dispute between Macedonia and Greece, uh, 25 years was made only in New York with the mediators, with two ministers of negotiations uh, saying there, even sometimes they didn't have a uh, direct uh, contact. The mediator went to one, one room, then to the second room, like was, for example, in a weird negotiation between Serbia and and, uh, and Kosovo leaders, they never had a con direct contact. They were in different rooms and just made it as well one to another room. 25 years, I think, Macedonia and Greece didn't have such kind of contact. Now, last year, we had direct contact, ministers, prime ministers, and so on, and now we probably will probably find a solution. The same was in Bulgaria, actually, a huge period because of this dispute with the history and the language. Uh, there was a dialogue about this. So for the first time we have a dialogue, it is good to have a dialogue and to clarify this issue. Of course, for, for me, the as anthropologist in the uprising it was a Romania, a uprising, much more than Macedonian or Bulgarian uprising, because in the same date, uh, the, the, the uprising was in Khrushchevo, which is a Vlaka oasis in Evesin and, and Klisun, actually. These three uh, main cities of the Bulgarian community in the Balkans there was a prize in England and so on. And always it's a question also for us that we are now putting in a stage. Why, when was the prize in Khrushchevo in uh, Nikola Tarev the Turk Khrushchev Republic, not Macedonian Republic, or any other, he declared it to be, this is Khrushchev Republic. So it's also very issue to discuss. But of course it's a, how to say, the issue for, to discuss of the historians not to be the part of the political process of a integration and that. For that reason, I think it's a good process and then we're starting the integration in NATO. And uh, again, the monuments, unfortunately, the former government of Nikola Gruevsky, it's a one project that called Scope in 2014, but it started somewhere in 2000, 2000 I think, nine. and then, nine. It was, we call the process of antiquization. So, because uh, the, some of the scholars in Macedonia, probably it's a historical truth, because uh, the, the ancient Macedonian nation, uh, people were disappearing in a space. So probably it was one kind of symbiosis. When the Slav people uh, tribes came, it was symbiosis. And of course, we can say that there's no any roots uh, of ancient Macedonian culture civilization in today. Uh, but it's a much more cultural, historical, anthropological issue. It's not political issue. But uh, the government of, uh, of Nikola Gruevsky, they wanted to, to say, okay, we are the descendants of Alexander the Great, and so on, and uh, we, we must also make a meet and couch for, uh, for the ancient Macedonian civilization. For that reason, we have the great monument of Alexander the Great there. And of course, the Greek can say that's a big provocation <laughs> of, uh, of the monuments of Philip the Great and so on. And, and Olympia, the mother of Alexander, and many other monuments, which are also from the Middle Age. Uh, actually, Macedonia is uh, so much more conflict about uh, this ancient Macedonian identity and uh, Slavic, which is also very proud history, because Cyril Samatoti was the creator of the, of the Cyrillic alphabet, <laughs> and Clement and uh, now they are also from Macedonia. <laughs> and we are, uh, but, uh, uh, Probably it's all false. So for example, I was too many times in Ukraine, in Poland, in, in, in Moscow, I was few They are not so much aware that these uh, signs are from Macedonia. 
So it's again full of uh, probably of our touristic managers. And so what to say that yeah, oh, hello, the grave of Clement is in Ohi there, or of uh, all these uh, kilometers there from Macedonia and so on. So, but probably we have also this problem of management, maybe expectations and management of the of the collective memory of the okay. Slavic people and culture. Yeah. I think okay. can, I think more than half an hour. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. You <coughs> covered a lot of historical ground as well and you gave us some, some historic sources of today's issues and problems. And uh, now we can move to Igor, maybe, and yeah, he has some interesting presentation for us from Mostar. Maybe we can take a look at pictures and just pass it around. So basically, I'm going to present on this uh, populist politics of remembering and forgetting at the partisan cemetery in Mostar. So just looking at the photo that, that I put uh, over there, being this the partisan cemetery in obvious status of uh, decay and being somehow overtaken by the weeds, its own position in the new states seems to resemble the position that uh, the Yugoslav memory and the Yugoslav associated identity has in current date on Bosnia and Herzegovina. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to start very quickly uh, with the theoretical framework that I use for inter interpreting this problem. I try to combine uh, um, memory identity and populism, see how they interrelate and how these uh, practices are embedded in physical and uh, social space. Uh, so basically, first uh, memory. So this memory work, it always happens within the social framework. So official memories, they are highly selective and are either inscriptive than descriptive. So even if these memories appear as consensual, uh, as we know, they are always in fact products of intense uh, contest and struggle and in some instances even of amitiation. So, a society is capable of uh, reconstructing its past at any given moment. It is only a question of power who is able to lead the public discourse and decide which memories are going to be banned and which promoted. So in a sense, memory is always embedded in complex power relations uh, that determine what is remembered or preserved and what is forgotten and repressed and for what ends and uh, by whom. So memory in this kind of sense is considered as a fluid process that is constantly uh, evolving and changing over time. So history itself actually only represents a pool of possibilities, events and contingencies. However, a specific version of this history, in order to become the history that matters, needs to be woven in this coherent and unidirectional narrative of the past. So, while reconsidering and reevaluating the social relationships and the hierarchy inside of any kind of community, memory politics actually serves the purpose due to the fact that it is always articulated in the present of constructing the current realm of uh, reality and contemporary social framework. So, if we go to the second, an identity. As Gillitz notes, identity depends uh, on the idea of memory and vice versa. So memory is always closely tied to the groups and consequently one's own sense of identity. We can infer that mutually there is this mutually dependent or mutually uh, constitutive uh, relationship between memory and identity. So in many instances, uh, imagined groups are bound together, as the first presentation clearly showed, by shared perceptions of past experiences that become crystallized in this dominant form of collective memory, which is of course changing. And the third uh, uh, factor is populism. So it is exactly at this point where we can, uh, it can be introduced because one of the intersections of uh, memory and populism could be found in identity politics. 
And this kind of populist practice of constructing the people is understood as a political operation par excellence of constituting unity inside of groups. So while excavating appropriate elements <coughs> found what is actually an amorphous popular block, populist practice consists in designation of imagined historic community <coughs> or historical political subject and that can be moved in actuality. So in this sense, once considered as a practice of creating a popular subject, memory serves the criteria of inclusion or exclusion, uh, supplying the cultural knowledge characterized by sharp distinctions made between those who belong and those who do not. So becoming foundation for reimagining or naming the groups or for drawing frontiers of political belonging, populist memory very simply rearticulates uh, images of the past in order to cement identities, create political subjects, legitimate present social order, and create contemporary social framework of relevance. And this is the very last thing I'm going to read. Uh, it's basically about the space, how these things are embedded in the space. So uh, as I imagine it, physical space, as this symbolic incarnation of memory, is a place where collective memory comes to be um, embodied. So space can be differentiated between absolute and social. So absolute space, uh, space presents crude physical world. However, the social space embodies a complex a symbolic system of conventions whose significance is socially produced and which is therefore a social product. So consequently, we can affirm that being, besides being a material construction, the space also represents a tool of symbolic control and domination. And finally, architecture uh, is a concept of analysis that encompasses uh, the totality of symbolic uh, objects that are found in a particular space, for example in the city. So they can consist of street names, monuments, graffitis and other toponyms that reflect both official and unofficial politics or realization of memory politics in space. So when we contemplate these different architect architectural designs, we can uh, affirm that cities hold pot uh, potential for powerful a projection of an image of the past. So in other words, cities have capacity to embody, materialize and represent collective memory and to symbolize it in time and space. So in this way, Azariaco considered city as text as a system of signs that transform official history and official identity into the semiosphere of the city, transforming the city into the space of historical memory, cultural, imaginary and political uh, vision. So, basically, Sandra, okay. So basically, uh, for the purposes of this presentation, we will uh, forget Ottomans uh, and everything that happened before 1941. But here we can see that we have three systems. We have 1941 in the city of Mostar and generally in Bosnia and Herzegovina until 1945, the presence of independent state of Croatia. It's a Nazi puppet regime, uh, which is very important for this discussion, is that there are presence of both Croat and Muslim political elites inside of this project. Then we have the communism from 45 to early 90s. In the 95 uh, ends, we have the Socialist Federative Republic of Yugoslavia and so on. In 92, uh, the war begins in Mostar. There is an invasion of Yugoslav People's Army, basically controlled by the Serb political elites. Uh, and we have a common organization of the Bosniak and Croat Army in generally three units, if we would to generalize. We have POS, we have RB, and we have EO. So basically, at the beginning, there was no war between Muslims and the Croats, uh, and the, the strongest of these three armies is the, is the Hos, and which is very important, it is the, the most uh, strongest one, and it's the most multi-ethnic army uh, in, in the city of Mostar. However, it has a strongly fascist uh, ideological connotations. Uh, again, once again, presence of both elites coming from the Croat and the Muslim sides. In 93, the host is dissolved and it's actually defeated by the Croatian Defense Council. So basically, uh, we can say in one way that the Croats defeated the Croats and get the host out of the way. And then we have the host that separates goats into the RP and Havel and we have this formation of what we now know, this war of all, all against all. So, we have the transition led by these armies and their political wings, and in the 1995 we have the date of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the reinterpretation of whatever is found in this month. So, very shortly, if we look at Mostar, it's important to note that what happened during the war, that city is effectively divided between Bosniaks and Croats. We have a physical disappearance of Serbs, if you look at the percentages, and we have a uh, yeah, how do you call it, symbolic disappearance of Yugoslavs. Because if you see, we had 10% of Yugoslavs in 1901, we don't have any Yugoslavs in 2013. So, 
In this kind of sense, uh, Mostar becomes some kind of a divided city, if we want to simplify it, divided between the Croat political elites and the Bosniak political elites. So it's basically two cities living side uh, by side. Basically, if you look at this photo here, this is Mostar. So basically, you see the pictures of the old bridge, you know, uniting different cultures. This is all bullshit. It's actually the boulevard of people's revolution that divides the city of Mostar. So this is actually the frontier. It goes like this. So uh, here you have the Bosniak part, here you have the Croat part. So basically here you have the flags of the armies that were connected with these national projects and they are very different if you go on different sides of the city. What is very interesting here is that Mostar, in a way, is both a central city and a peripheral city. So for the Croat national project is a central city. Why? Because Muslims have, let's say, political elites have Sarajevo and the Serbs have Banja Luka. Croats tried to get a uh, hold of Mostar. They proclaimed it the capital city of the Croatian Republic of Herceg Bosna, and for this reason, it's very important for the Croat political project, uh, much more than for, than it would be for the for the Bosniak nationalist project. But there is very many uh, interesting facts on the relations of the Bosniak from Sarajevo and the Bosniak from Mostar during the war, when sometimes supplies will not come from Sarajevo to help the Bosniak brothers. So. Uh, what, what happens here that we have a huge uh, change of toponyms on the west side and very insignificant change of toponyms on the east side. So we can have what we call Croatization of the west side of the Mostar, where basically uh, everything becomes, you know, named in this kind of Croat terms and imagined as a, you know, ancient Croat city or whatever this would be. This doesn't happen in the in the east side. Very simply, if we look. If we have three biggest streets and most important streets in Mostar, one is in the U.S. Star Times, Mariscal Tito Street, the another one is a Boulevard of People's Revolution, and the third one is 14th of February, it's a day of liberation of Mostar. Mariscal Tito, which is on the east side, he doesn't get exiled from the city, Boulevard is just a border, so we will forget about it, but the 14th of February becomes to be termed the street of the Croat kid Tomislav. Uh, also, the biggest square in the city, which was the square of 14th of February, uh, comes to be uh, turned as a, a square of Croat noblemen. So, uh, in what happens, and this is the problem, the main problem, is that uh, remnants of Yugoslav times is the partisan cemetery and Veles football club. But if you look, this is where Veles plays, and this is where the partisan football, uh, part, not football club, partisan cemetery is. So, they're both on the Croat side. Veles gets kicked out, now plays here. <laughs> and uh, basically, Partizansko Groblje stays there. What is the problem with Partizansko Groblje? You know, you have seen this uh, goodbye Lenin, you know, and they take the statue of Lenin very easily. There is Coca Cola coming and overtaking it. But with Partizan Cemetery, you cannot do this. It's 5,000 uh, 5, meters squared uh, uh, big, and that's why you really can't replace it very easily. So if you look at this monument, it is huge, it is monumental, and it's different to get it out of the city. So uh, there were two attempts of detonations, none of them uh, actually uh, were successful. And uh, the problem is that uh, basically uh, the, the, the Croat national narrative, and it is it's obvious by now, which tries to expel this uh, anything connected to the Yugoslavia as a foreign body that it doesn't want to have uh, as part of its own identity. So this place is left to ruin, and basically it, uh, it, the, 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 the graffiti that you could find on the partisan cemetery very much reflect this official hegemonic Croat nationalist politics uh, in this set. So one of the monuments says, I am Ustasha, my father is a communist, I will kill him, so help me Jesus. Uh, this picture over here is a calls for third entity, basically the <coughs> idea of the establishment of the Croat Republic inside of Bosnia and Herzegovina. This is the commemoration of the Social Democrats on the 14th of February that happens every uh, year. Uh, they are the only party that kind of tries to preserve this memory in a very specific way. And this is the message uh, that's given to those who come to commemorate here. It says, glorify your crimes and criminals somewhere more to the east. Basically saying, go to the other part of the city, don't come here. So because this is you, this is not us. And so, <coughs> so uh, this is another problem. Once during the commemoration, uh, there was an attempt to stop the commemoration of, from happening, and so on. Uh, it's just a normal thing. And uh, here is the, the arrival of the Bosniak uh, Ethno Nationalist Party for the first time at this cemetery in 2017. So, 22 years after the war. Uh, they have a very, as we have talked about it, they have very different. Uh, 
you know, relation to the Yugoslavia and the social democrats, which are also generally Bosnian, but they attempt to be multi -ethnic. So, uh, during the day of Europe and victory of fascism in 2018, they came for the second time, and this is a speech given by the Prime Minister of Bosnia and Herzegovina, who comes from this party. He says, our engagement here will not stop. Today, all over the planet, people are celebrating day of victory over fascism, but unfortunately, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we are well aware that fascist hegemonic ideologies are not yet defeated. We cannot forget our past, so that future generations will not start forgetting what happened here 20 years ago. Uh, fascism happened again on the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So basically, there is many questions uh, to ask here. Who are we? Who are the fascists? What is our past? And how is the 20 years ago interrelated in the new narrative uh, of something that happened uh, in the 1940s? So uh, the Croat political elites, of course, they are not present uh, at such events. Uh, and they call this an attempt of provocation. Uh, Dimitar was talking about Blyburg, where three days after this, the Croat member of the presidency, go, he goes to Blyburg, basically say, who are his people, and uh, uh, commemorating something that became the myth of Croatian martyrdom uh, during the Second World War, the delivery of the, of the fascist uh, the, uh, army to the Yugoslav people's army, which ended up in some questionable things, which should be, of course, investigated. So the Croat the mayor of Mostar on the same day, 9 of May, uh, the day of Europe, he uh, celebrates the same day, but he goes to the Croatian University of Mostar because the memories cannot in any way be shared. Uh, so basically, what I'm trying to do in this uh, article or investigation, I try to take uh, five different general imagined uh, mnemonic entrepreneurs, which is the main Croat nationalist party, the main uh, Bosniak Nationalist Party, the Social Democrats that attempt to be multi-ethnic but are not very successful, uh, and I also try to see how organized Serbian politics in the city of Mostar is trying to reimagine this place, because they have physically been banished from the city, but they are trying to uh, come back, and I think the, the process is happening slowly, so it's interesting to see how they can position themselves inside of this concept, uh, inside of this context, and I also, of course, am very much interested in the formal group of activists to see what is the space that they can uh, assert and uh, take over inside of this uh, very uh, nationalistically hegemonic uh, view of the, of the monument uh, and exclusivist itself. So the key words uh, which are empty signifiers also is anti-fascism, 14 of February, partisan Yugoslavia, Ustasha, Komis, and so on and so forth. And we talked other days about democracy. It doesn't basically mean anything before you start talking about it. Because Fascists are the Croats, but in the new narrative, the, the Bosniaks were never fascists. They were never, you know, collaborators. They are also the victims and so on the, and so forth, which is something interesting to investigate. So I use the discourse analysis and the ethnographic interpretation, but because I'm particularly interested in the informal group of activists, because uh, we know so much about the nationalists, uh, I want to even start thinking how to think this uh, must start today. So are these two, three, or 33 cities? Or maybe is it most are no more? Can this implacable autophagy called division be redrawn by some other lines or measured and painted by some other mechanism? So basically, this is the informal group of actors that are trying to do something with this thing. We still don't know what this precisely is. So at the end, I'm going to tell you, just read you uh, the interpretation of the monument given by the architect, Bogdan Bogdanovich. Uh, and you will see that, of course, his amputation has nothing to do with, I, with what I have talked about so far, because in the end, who cares about the architects? Is the politics that gives this meaning to the monument, and so on and so forth. So this is what he says about the monument. And as you can see, this monument doesn't even have a single red star on it. You know, this is the thing. You know, it's nothing with, uh, connected with, uh, with the ideology of communism and so on and so forth. So he says. The stone allegory of two cities hasn't accidentally, without any external nuances, taken place on uh, one of the bare, stony hills of western Mostar. Quite vaguely, somewhere between the sky and the earth, as the old books say, flows the city of Urqualia, the, the sophistic peer of Manike Estera Lucide, which represented in Gnostic speculations a kind of a starting point for a journey in the world of wonderful, naive, but eternal philosophical and cosmopoetical images. And I thought the fallen anti-fascist soldiers, still boys and girls, so to speak, have at least symbolical right for the beauty of dreams. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. I think that even
through one case or site of murder, you managed to explain to us the politics of the whole country. Um, Astrea, please. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ayas, for having me, all of you for coming, and uh, to you too for really rich uh, presentations, uh, both historically and uh, going really deep into the description of uh, this particular issue. So, um, I, I don't know, basically I think that uh, I would like to just uh, kind of round up the, this two presentations with maybe at the end few questions so that we can after the little break all discuss. So uh, where I would like to begin basically is um, maybe just a little remark. When we talk about populism, I think it's kind of, it's, it's a very popular concept, right? And uh, it's maybe an overpresent in, in theory, especially in political science. But uh, I, what I noticed that uh, it also came to, to everyday discourses, to everyday life, so people would refer to, to their political systems as populist. But I think if, if a scholar would talk to an, to an everyday person and start to discuss what does populism mean to people and what does populism mean to us who sit here and are in the position to construct such, um, such concepts would be something quite different. So I'm not sure that, so I, I wonder, I'm never sure, but I wonder uh, how this particular concept actually account for for different issues and different political systems. So, what does it mean, basically, populism? Because in in theory, we have so so many different approaches and then different uh, different disciplines. For example, in political science and in anthropology, we would completely different approach. Uh, we would approach differently to to populism, ask different questions, hence get different answers, and then what, what did we get at the end of the day from it? So, so that's maybe the first question for later for, for all of us. So um, I found an interesting definition of populism by a Serbian historian, so maybe not the most common topic for history. So she wrote, uh, well, she recently published a book, Dubrek Kostojanovic, some, some know, some don't, doesn't matter, but she, she recently wrote a book, uh, well, published a book after many of her texts uh, about populism in Serbia. And what she says, she said, it's a beautiful concept that Serbs can offer to the world because she believes that actually Serb, uh, Serbs invented it. So she tries, she uses these dominant maybe most exploited definitions of populism, and then she applied them to, uh, to political systems in Serbia since uh, 18th century, basically. Oh, sorry, 19th century. Uh, and uh, at some point she says, uh, as her definition or her framework within, within, she, within which she works, basically she says that uh, the key characteristic of populism is collectivist emotion, so what I really like about that is that she emphasizes this part of emotion. To go back to my first remark that when we talk to people, they also refer to, to political systems as populist, and it's something that can be felt. So it's a collectivist emotion. Uh, and she says, which sucks in every individual and crushes every pluralism. It always speaks in the name of entire people, which we all already put as sort of a, point on the board and she says the possibility to stay outside and think differently is excluded. So something this is already known from, from various definitions but I, as I wanted to say, I really like this emotional uh, emphasis in the definition. So she said in, in her book basically that uh, uh, through, through this analysis, she wants to say that uh, she wants to show that populism was invented. I mean, it's, it's an ironical uh, distance that she takes, but still, that it's something that Serbia has to offer to theory is this concept of uh, real existing populism through history. So it made me think um, why we have this panel, I guess, and uh, it's something that I was asked in my comprehensive exam when I was presenting my. Um, my uh, research to, to the jury. 
So basically, at the end, they ask him, they said, okay, Astrea, this is all wonderful, bravo, kudos, but uh, why do you think it's important to study Ser contemporary Serbia today for theory, for anthropological and social theory? And they said, you don't have to, to answer that now in, in this particular room, but it's basically something that you have to think about. So I, I think that is a really important question. And uh, many things have been said about uh, politics and culture and world all around. And uh, we tend sometimes to, when we think about our own researchers, to think that why do I do this because everything has been said already, etc., etc. So it, it's something that is constantly on my mind is basically why, like the name of the, of the group on Facebook, why we study Eastern Europe. <laughs> So why, why do we study Balkans and why, why do we take this chunk of, of land to, to think to, that we, by researching it, have to contribute something to social sciences today? So I, what I think, why is it important to talk about uh, Southeastern Europe or post-Yugoslav space, including the, the whole Balkan region as leaving the consequences of of what happened in, in Yugoslavia in the 90s, I think that, uh, again, from anthropological perspective, uh, is uh, that we have this piece of land in Europe that uh, had a war in, uh, well, the first and only war after, after the Second World War with many atrocities and with uh, terribly bad things happening, complete reconstruction of uh, ethnic um, blueprint of, of the region and uh, four million displaced people and refugees. So it's something quite radical that happened in Europe in the 1990s that uh, for social sciences opened a huge space basically to understand contemporary world and how we live today and what is happening. So talking about populism I think uh, is important to, to place it in this post-war Society. So if we have populism as this idea or practice or however we define it, I think that it is interesting to observe it in the space of, uh, in, in the well, space of former warfare. So uh, another important thing I wanted to, to debate and to open as a question for all of you is uh, that uh, it is tended to, to be said that basically when we talk about post-Yugoslav space, we talk about post-conflict space. So it is something that I try to account for in my research, is to challenge this idea of post-conflict. And uh, it, um, so when we think about, for example, post-colonial theory, that some are maybe more familiar of, so post-colonial theory received a lot of critique as a paradigm. So basically what, um, what uh, criticism of post-colonial theory says is that uh, there is nothing post about, about this uh, part of the world that we refer as post-colonial because what is pre and what is uh, what post-colonial, what was pre-colonial, so it offers this teleological perspective that something grew out of something else and that it was a natural process while this post-colonialism doesn't mean that there is a clear cut with colonial period, it's done, and now we live something that, that, is, that comes after, but we actually live some sort of continuity, and that is an important thing that anthropology uh, problematizes a lot, is how particular society or a group uh, exists through creation of continuities and discontinuities with something that was before. So I, I think that um, uh, this part of the world that we talk about, uh, that we talk about today, is very important chunk of land <coughs> that can challenge this post-conflict paradigm to its best. So to come back to the funny example that Dimitar gave at the, at the beginning is something that I write about in, in my thesis, is this chocolate war that happened in Croatia. So as he already said, basically, the president of Croatia gave Serbian chocolate, so-called, uh, to Croatian kids, right? 
and the international scandal arises out of that she has <coughs> officially apologized to the citizens of Croatia and she promised that she, I actually don't know if she ever distributed new yeah, chocolates. Yeah, she, she did? Mm -hmm. Right, okay, but she, she promised on TV, in the prime time, uh, news program at 8 o'clock, you know, national TV program one, she apologized and said, I promise that I will distribute Croatian chocolates. So it's, I mean, it's funny and absurd, of course, but uh, it wasn't actually the only thing that happened to Croatia related to chocolate. So a year before this scandal, uh, Croatian ambassador in Slovenia uh, sent a box of chocolates to Slovenian uh, Minister of International Relations. So it's a box, and on the box there is a map of Croatia, and it says greetings from Croatia. You know, inside beautiful chocolates, hazelnuts, nuts, <laughs> everything else. And what happens is that uh, the, the Minister of International Relations from uh, Slovenian International Relations returns the gift which anthropology, like early anthropology, worked, worked a lot with the gift economy. So basically how societies uh, built uh, their economic systems and their, their whole cultures and power relations only on gift exchange. So in gift economy, to return a gift can often mean declaration of war. Okay, not in the West world in 21st century, but still on symbolical level, he, he in a way declared the war. Why? The map, of, uh, the map of Croatia that was depicted on the lid of the box uh, basically placed a border between Croatia and Slovenia inside the disputed zone that is still a recidive from the, from the 90s war, from, from, I mean, Yugoslav 90s wars. So basically what, what happened, there is a one pair in uh, here, here in uh, between Croatia and Slovenia and Piran, be and uh, it's under international arbitrage <coughs> who does it belong to, whether it's Slovenian or Croatian. So it was also an issue to stop Croatia from entering the EU for, for a certain amount of time. Therefore, the creation of, of a small war, a private war, uh, it was basically on the map, on the lead, was placed on, at the wrong place from Slovenian perspective. So, uh, there are many examples of that. Another one is from Serbia. Uh, Minister of uh, Law, no? Justice. Uh, Justice, thank you. We have, it's the same word in Serbian. Uh, Minister of Justice from, from Serbia, he was uh, at a visit at the law, law school, law university in Belgrade, and he was giving some sort of a lecture. Suddenly he stopped, approached the girl in the audience, took a bottle of water from her that she was drinking and threw it in the garbage. What happened? She was drinking Yana water and Yana is a Croatian brand. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, after the little performance, he basically said, if you want to save the state, you have to buy only products produced in your own state. And, and so on and so on. So, we read this one little sensational article in the newspaper, we laugh, we think ha ha ha, but then we realize that what happens is that all of these ethnic prefix, prefixes that we had, um, well, th that had their momentum in the late 80s and the 1990s during the war, that something is Serbian, Croatian, Albanian, this or that, basically came into the everyday life and started to mark our mundane things, you know, like water, chocolates, socks, and uh, many other things. But not only do they signify things that we use today, they also, as we see from the creation uh, example with chocolates, they can also be the reasons or some sort of triggers for conflict. So in a situation when those things occur, on basically everyday level, th these are just examples that came to the news, but we if something like that comes to the news, we can assume that it happens uh, a lot on everyday level. So uh, then we should ask, is this post-conflict? So 
So what does it mean to have chocolates that can basically create war in, and can we account for the societies that, um, that produce this sort of um, events as post-conflict? So basically what, uh, what I think that uh, our region can, can contribute, well, our region of interest and research can contribute to, uh, to the social sciences is problematization of this post-war paradigm. Um, but also um, research like that in anthropology is happening, for example, in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, especially in Sri Lanka and uh, Bhutan. But uh, I think that um, uh, what, what is unique is that this is happening in Europe. And that uh, basically by researching this, we can, we can learn a lot about contemporary governance and, uh, and uh, contemporary issues as well. So uh, I think another important uh, part of this problematization of post-conflict uh, post-conflict uh, uh, post uh, paradigm and how it basically, basically induces populism and allows space for populist practices to to blossom, I would say, or mushroom, uh, is uh, the so having in mind that it is, that it is, it is a post-war uh, post space, uh, there is a, how say, process of transitional justice that is happening uh, still, and I think that is also something very important that we should have to account uh, when we think about populism, and especially when we think about memory and populism, because transitional justice is uh, is an uh, instance that basically induces memory on a, on a very high level. So um, uh, what I think is particularly important when, when we talk about uh, memory is that uh, transitional justice is a system that, uh, so certain memory entrepreneurs that uh, Igor mentioned uh, would maybe push for forgetting and uh, also th there are different, uh, different uh, memory entrepreneurs that claim that uh, the region is forgetting the war. And, uh, but I think that uh, the presence of transitional justice as an important player of the contemporary politics in, um, in post-Yugoslav space or the Balkan Balkans uh, is something that uh, operates as a uh, important memory entrepreneur, but also the one that only opens the space to speak about war crimes and atrocities and uh, frames uh, the memory, frames memory into, into certain, how would I put it, um, well, f frames it as, well, basically as the space of atrocity. And uh, so, we, although, through the memory, uh, through the transitional justice, basically only the uh, individuals accused, so it is not states on trials, but individuals on trials, but still, uh, so I don't want to go deep into it, but the way that uh, trials were conducted and the different initiatives operated uh, opened the space for uh, uh, this uh, notion of uh, uh, peoples on trials, basically, rather than individuals on trials. So it is not uh, uh, Ratko Mladic who was accused for genocide, but it's Serbian people or Serbian state that was accused for genocide when we, when we turn this discussion to, to some sort of rather everyday level. So uh, yes, it's, uh, that is my third point. I would say that the importance of transitional justice it also is also one uh, of the players who enable populism to occur in in the region. So I would kind of stop here, basically. So uh, I, I just to conclude, I would say that um, uh, this whole idea of the book uh, project that we do here and uh, connecting memory and populism together into analysis is I think important because we would, uh, by doing that basically I think it's, uh, it would allow us to uh, operate not as only, uh, to, well, uh, 
Okay, so it, it's not just the analysis of populist practices, but actually trying to take one practice from this uh, whole scope of what populism operates with, and by, by working with it, is basically to show how populism ha can have its different varieties and maybe to offer something quite new for, for social science. That's for me. <laughs> Thank you.